Good morning to all of you. Distinguished participants, my name is Sam Bakning, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. I'm also a professor of psychology in Southern Federal University in rostov on don in the Russian Federation, and in CIAS CIAFS, the Center for Advanced Professional Studies. I'm also a professor of finance and the psychology of finance. But today I will be talking about a, a nexus between a strictly medical issue and an issue of ethics, philosophy, conduct, and a way of life. Very often medical decisions, as you all know, are influenced by considerations which are not strictly medical, considerations which are extra-medical. Euthanasia is one such case. It is not the right to live, but the right to die. Euthanasia, uh, whether in a medical setting, like a hospital, a clinic, or a hospice, or whether outside of a medical setting, like at home, is often erroneously described as mercy killing. Most forms of euthanasia are indeed motivated by, some say misplaced, mercy. But there are other forms which are not motivated by mercy. In Greek, generally, the prefix eu, eu, means both well and easy. Thanatos is death. Good death, easy death, is what euthanasia means. Euthanasia is the intentional, intentional premature termination of another person's life, either by direct intervention, which is active euthanasia, or by withholding life-promoting measures and resources, passive euthanasia. And this is either at the express or the implied request of that person, a voluntary euthanasia, or in the absence of such approval, a non-voluntary euthanasia. In voluntary euthanasia, where the individual wishes to go on living, is a euphemism for murder. Modern medicine seems to be preoccupied with delusions of omnipotence and the need to avoid the narcissistic injury to the doctor's ego that death constitutes. This preference of the profession's image over the patient's welfare and quality of life is patently unethical. But to my mind, passive euthanasia is equally immoral. The abrupt withdrawal of medical treatment, feeding and hydration results in a slow and potentially torturous death. It took Terry Schiavo 13 days to die when her tubes were withdrawn in the last two weeks of March 2005. Since it is impossible to conclusively prove that patients in persistent vegetative state, PVS, do not suffer pain, it is morally wrong to subject them to such potential gratuitous suffering. Even animals should be treated better than them. Moreover, passive euthanasia allows us to evade personal responsibility for the patient's death. In active euthanasia, the relationship between the act of administering legal medicine, for instance, and its consequences is direct and unambiguous, not so in passive euthanasia. As the philosopher John Finnis notes, to qualify as euthanasia, the termination of life has to be the main and intended aim of the act or omission act or omission that lead to the end of life. If the loss of life is incidental, if it is a kind of side effect, the agent is still morally responsible, but to describe his actions and omissions as euthanasia would be very misleading. Voluntariness, accepting the foreseen but unintended consequences of one's actions and omissions, should be distinguished from intention though. Sometimes we do something and we are aware that it could have unintended consequences, and we accept them in advance. But this does not constitute consent, nor is it a voluntary form of action. Still, all this sophistry obscures the main issue, and the main issue is if the sanctity of life 
is supreme and overriding value, if it's what we call a basic good, it ought to surely preclude and proscribe all acts and omissions which may shorten it, even when the shortening of life is a mere deleterious side effect. But this is not the case in my view. The sanctity and value of life compete with a host of other equally potent, equipotent moral demands. Even the most devout pro-life ethicists accepts that certain medical decisions, for instance, to administer strong analgesics, inv inevitably truncate the patient's life. <clears throat> Yet this is considered moral, giving strong anti-pain medication, palliative care, is considered moral even if it shortens the patient's life, because the resulting euthanasia is not the main intention of the pain-relieving doctor. Moreover, the apparent dilemma between the two values, to reduce suffering or to preserve life, is in my view only apparent. I would even go as far as saying that this dilemma is non-existent. There are four possible situations. Imagine a patient writhing with insufferable pain on the bed opposite you. Option number one, the patient's life is not at risk if she is not medicated with painkillers but she is at risk, her life is at risk, if she is medicated. That is situation number one. Situation number two, the patient's life is not at risk either way, whether she's medicated or not. Situation number three, the patient's life is at risk either way, um, uh, is not at risk either way, whether she's medicated or not. And the fourth situation is the patient's life is at risk if she is not medicated with painkillers. So four very clear distinct situations. But in all four cases, the decisions our doctor has to make are ethically clear cut. He should administer pain alleviating drugs, except when the patient risks dying. In other words, except in scenario number one. The possible shortening of the patient's life, which is guesswork at best, is immaterial in my view. I would go against the grain of current ethical thinking. So, my conclusion is that it is easy to distinguish between euthanasia, to distinguish euthanasia from all other forms of termination of life. Voluntary, active euthanasia is morally defensible, at least in principle, as you will see shortly. But other types of euthanasia are not ethically acceptable or morally defensible, and in some cases constitute literally crime. So, who is or should be subjected to euthanasia? That brings us to the problem of dualism versus reductionism. I know these are not words you usually hear in medical set settings, but it's good to get this background. With the exception of radical animal rights activists, most philosophers and laymen consider people, human beings, to be entitled to a kind of special treatment to be in possession of unique rights and commensurate obligations, and to be capable of feats unparalleled in other species. Thus, opponents of euthanasia universally oppose the killing of persons, but not the killing of animals. The pro-euthanasia philosopher John Harris puts it, concern for their welfare, respect for their wishes, respect for the intr intrinsic value of their lives, and respect for their interests. This is how we should treat people. Robert Dworkin emphasized the investments made by nature, the person involved, others, the investments with which euthanasia wastes put an end to. He says that euthanasia is wasteful, but he also draws attention to the person's critical interests, the interests whose satisfaction makes life better to live or even worth living. The manner of one's own death may be such a critical interest in my view. Hence, one should have the right to choose how one dies, because the right kind of death, let's say painless death, quick death, dignified death, well, the right kind of death reflects one's entire life, reflects on one's entire life, ref affirms, improves this life. But this leads to another interesting question. Who is a person? What makes us human? 
Well, many things, most of which are irrelevant to our discussion. But broadly speaking, though, there are two schools of thought. One, that we are rendered human by the very event of our conception. conception. Egg meets sperm, therefore human. Or at the very latest, when we are born. The minute we are born, we are human. And there's another school that says that we are considered human only when we act or think as sentient, conscious humans do. The proponents of the first case, which is the automatic case, claim that merely possessing a human body, or the potential to come to possess such a body, such as in a fertilized egg, is enough to qualify us as a person. There is no distinction between mind and abode. Thoughts, feelings and actions are merely manifestations of one's underlying unity. The fact that some of these manifestations have yet to materialize in the case of a fetus or an embryo, and the fact that some of these manifestations are mere potentials in the case of a comatose patient, this, do, this does not detract from our essential, incontrovertible and indivisible humanity. We may be immature, we may be damaged, but we are still persons, all the same, and always will be persons. Though considered somewhat religious and spiritual, this philosophical notion is actually a form of reductionism. The mind, the soul, the spirit, whatever you want to call it, they are all expressions of one unity grounded in our hardware, in our bodies. Those who argue the second case postulate that it is possible to have a human body which does not host a person. People in persistent vegetative states, in coma, for, for instance, fetuses, for instance, they are human, but they are non-persons. They are not people. They are just bodies. This is because they do not yet, or are unable to, <clears throat> exercise their faculties, and most importantly, the faculty of free choice. Personhood is complexity, especially behavioral complexity, cognitive complexity, emotional complexity. When the latter sees when there's no such complex complexity, so does the former personhood. In the absence of complexity, there is no personhood. Personhood is acquired and is an extensive parameter. It's a total, it's a defining state of being. One is either awake or asleep, dead or alive, in a state of personhood or not. The latter approach involves fine distinctions between potential, capacity and skill. A human body or a fertilized egg have the potential to think, they have the potential to write poetry, to feel pain, to value life. At the right phase of somatic development, this potential most, most often becomes capacity, and once it is com competently exercised, it is a skill. Embryos and comatose people may have the potential to do, they have the potential to think, but in the absence of capacities, in the absence of skills, they are not full-fledged persons. Indeed, in all important respects, they are, they are kind of already dead. Taken to its logical conclusion, this definition of a person, of personhood, also excludes newborn infants, the severely retarded, the hopelessly quadriplegic, and the catatonic. Who is a person becomes a matter of culturally bound and medically informed judgments, which may be influenced by both ignorance and fashion, and also by advances in research. And thus they can be very arbitrary. And if they are arbitrary, they are ipso facto, immoral. Imagine a computer infected by a computer virus, uh, infected with a computer virus, which cannot be corrupted, cannot be deleted, or cannot be fixed. The virus disables the host the computer, and renders it dead. Is it still a computer? If someone uh, were to break into my house and to steal it, can I file an insurance claim and say that my computer had been stolen? This virus-infected computer which does and cannot do anything. If a colleague destroys my computer, can I sue her for damages? And the answer is yes, I can. A computer is a computer for as long as it exists physically. 
and a cure is bound to be found sometime, even against the most transient virus and against the most persistent vegetative state. And if you wait long enough, every embryo, or most embryos, become persons with capacities and with skills. So I personally am against the second um, approach. The conclusion is, the definition of personhood must rely on an objective, determinate and determinable criteria. The anti-euthanasia camp relies on bodily existence as one such criteria. The pro-euthanasia faction has yet to reciprocate. I didn't hear a good argument yet. What about euthanasia and suicide? Aren't they closely related? Aren't they kind of first cousins? Self-sacrifice, avoidable martyrdom, engaging in life-risking activities, refusal to prolong one's life through medical treatment, euthanasia, overdosing, self-destruction, that is a result of coercion. These are all forms of closely uh, related self-destructive acts. They all, in a way, forms of suicide. They all involve a deliberately self-inflicted death. But while suicide is chiefly intended to terminate a life, all the other acts I've mentioned are aimed at perpetuating, uh, strengthening and defending values, causes, or other people. Many, and not only religious people, are appalled by the choice implied in suicide of the choice of death of a life. They feel that it demeans life and abnegates its meaning. Life's meaning, the outcome of active selection by, by the individual, life's meaning is either external, such as in God's plan, plan if you're religious, or it may be internal, the outcome of an arbitrary frame of reference, such as having a career goal. <laughs> Our life is rendered meaningful only by integrating it into an eternal thing, process, design, or being, something bigger than ourselves. Suicide makes life trivial, frivolous, because the act is not natural, not part of any framework, uh, not part of an undying process, timeless cycle of birth and death. It's, suicide is timeless. It's a break with eternity. Henry Sidgwick said that only conscious, in other words, intelligent beings, sentient beings, can appreciate values and meanings. So life is significant, but only to conscious, intelligent, though finite, finite beings. It is meaningful because it is a part of some eternal goal, some plan, some process, some thing, some design, some being. As I said, something bigger than us. Suicide flies in the face of Sidgwick's dictum. It is a statement by an intelligent and conscious being about the meaninglessness of life. If suicide is a statement, then society in this case is against the freedom of expression. In the case of suicide, free speech dissonantly clashes and conflicts with the sanctity of a meaningful life. To rid itself of the anxiety brought on by this conflict, society casts suicide as a depraved or even in some cases, some jurisdictions, a criminal act, and its perpetrators are much, much castigated and chastised. Suicide violates not only the social contract, but many will add covenants with God or with nature itself. St. Thomas Aquinas wrote in the Summa Theologia that since organisms strive to survive, suicide is an unnatural act. Moreover, it adversely affects the community and violates the property rights of God, the imputed owner of one's spirit. Christianity regards the immortal soul as a gift, and in Jewish writings it is a deposit. Suicide amounts to the abuse or misuse of God's possessions, temporarily lodged in a corporeal mansion, our body. This paternalism was propagated centuries later by Sir William Blackstone, the codifier of British law. Suicide, being self-murder, is a grave felony, which the state has a right to prevent and even to punish for. In certain countries, this is still the case. In Israel, for instance, a soldier is considered to be military property. An attempted, an attempted suicide is severely punished as the corruption 
of Armin Chatel. Paternalism, a malignant mutation of benevolence, is about objectifying people and treating them as possessions. Even fully informed and consenting adults are not granted full, unmitigated autonomy, freedom and privacy. This tends to breed victimless crimes. The culprits, gamblers, homosexuals, communists, suicides, drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes, whatever, the culprits are protected from themselves by an intrusive nanny state. The possession of a right by a person imposes on others a corresponding um, obligation. The obligation is not to frustrate the exercise of their right. And suicide is often the choice of a mentally and legally competent adult. Life is such a basic and deep-set phenomenon that even the incompetence, the mentally uh, retarded or challenged or the mentally insane or minors, even these can fully gauge its significance and make kind of informed decisions, in my view. The paternalists claim, counterfactually, that no competent adult in his right mind will ever decide to commit suicide. That is, of course, utter nonsense. They cite the cases of suicides which survived and felt very happy that they have survived, as compelling reason to intervene. But we all make irreversible decisions, for which sometimes we are sorry. It gives no one, no one the corresponding right to interfere and prevent us. Paternalism is a slippery slope. Should the state be allowed to prevent the birth of a genetically defective child, or to forbid his parents to get married in the first place? Should unhealthy adults be forced to abstain from smoking, or steer clear from, uh, from uh, alcohol? Should they be coerced to exercise? Where's the limit? Where's the end of state involvement? Suicide is subject to a double moral standard. People are permitted, actually encouraged, to sacrifice their life only in certain socially sanctioned ways. To die on the battlefield or in defense of one's, re defense of one's religion is commendable. This hypocrisy reveals how power structures and the elites, state, institutional religion, political parties, national movement, religious movements, aim to monopolize the lives of citizens and adherents to do with as they see fit. Suicide threatens this monopoly. It's very simple. Hence the taboo. So, let's come back to the basics. Euthanasia is taking one's own life. It's a form of suicide. Voluntary euthanasia. So, does one have a right to take one's own life? The answer is not as clear-cut as I imply. It depends. Certain cultures and societies encourage suicide. Both Japanese kamikaze and Jewish martyrs were extolled for their suicidal actions. Certain professions are knowingly life-threatening. Soldiers, firemen, policemen. Certain industries, like the manufacture of armaments, cigarettes, alcohol, and even fireworks, boost overall mortality rates. In general, Suicide is commended by society when it serves social ends, enhances the cohesion of the group, upholds its values, multiplies its wealth, or defends it from external and internal threats. Social structures and human collectives, empires, countries, firms, bands, institutions, gangs, these often commit suicide. This is considered to be a healthy process. So, the central dilemma is, is it morally justified to commit suicide in order to avoid certain forthcoming ineluctable and unrelenting torture, pain, or coma? Is it morally justified to ask others to help you to commit suicide, for instance, if you are incapacitated? Imagine a society that venerates life with dignity, uh, but life with dignity, by making euthanasia Mandatory. So imagine a society where life is only life worth living if it, in, if it includes dignity. And so this kind of society makes euthanasia mandatory. Um, there's actually a, a, a novel by the name, uh, by the title The Fixed Period. It's Trollope's Britannula. Um, it's such a country. W would such a society then and there be morally justified? to refuse to commit suicide or to help in it? In other words, in a society which makes euthanasia mandatory, would the refusal to commit suicide be sanctioned 
will it be will be people helped not to commit suicide? Will there be an under, underground smuggling people away if they don't want to commit suicide? So, by flipping the coin, we see the dilemmas emerge. Though legal in many countries, suicide is still frowned upon, except when it amounts to socially sanctioned self-sacrifice. Assisted suicide is both condemned and illegal in most parts of the world. And this is logically inconsistent, of course, but reflects society's fear of a slippery slope, which may lead from assisted suicide to all manner of murder. Imagine killing someone before we have ascertained her preferences as to the manner of her death, before we have made sure whether she wants to die at all. This constitutes murder, even if after the fact we can prove conclusively that the victim had wanted to die. Is murder, therefore, merely the act of taking life, regardless of circumstances, or is it the nature of the interpersonal interaction that counts? Is it the mens rea or the actus reus? In the latter case, the um, victim's will counts. In the former case, it is irrelevant. Few philosophers, legislators, and laymen support non-voluntary or involuntary euthanasia. These types of mercy, so-called killings, are associated with the most heinous crimes against humanity committed by the Nazi regime on both its own people and on other nations. They are and were always an integral part of every program of active eugenics. The arguments against killing someone who hasn't expressed a wish to die let alone someone who has expressed a desire to go on living. These arguments revolve around the right to life. People are assumed to value their life, cherish it, and protect it. And euthanasia, especially the non-voluntary forms, amounts to depriving someone, as well as their nearest and dearest, of something they value. The right to life, at least as far as human beings are concerned, is a rarely questioned fundamental moral principle. In Western cultures, it is assumed to be inalienable, inalienable and indivisible, in other words, monolithic. Yet, of course, the right to life is neither inalienable nor divisible, indivisible. Even if we accept the axiomatic and, therefore, in my, in my view, arbitrary uh, source of this right, we are still faced with intractable dilemmas. All said, the right to life may be nothing more than a cultural construct dependent on social mores, historical contexts, and exegetic systems of, for example, religion. Rights, whether moral rights or legal rights, impose obligations or duties on third parties toward the right holder. One has a right against other people, and thus can prescribe to them certain obligatory behaviors and proscribe certain acts or omissions. Rights and duties are two sides of the same Janus-like ethical coin. And this duality confuses people. They often erroneously identify rights with their attendant duties and obligations, with the morally decent, or even with the morally permissible. One's rights inform other people how they must behave towards one, not how they should or ought to act morally. Moral behavior is not dependent on the existence of a right. Obligations to behave are dependent on the existence of a right. Obligations do not always coexist with morality. They are definitely not coextant. To complicate matters, uh, complicate matters further, many apparently simple and straightforward rights are amalgams of more basic moral or legal principles. To treat such rights as monolithic unities is to mistreat and misunderstand them. Consider the right to life. It is a compendium of no less than eight distinct rights. The right to be brought to life, the right to be born, the right to have one's life maintained, the right not to be killed, the right to have one's life saved, the right to save one's life, wrongly reduced to the right uh, to self-defense the right to terminate one's life, and the right to have one's life terminated. None of these rights is self-evident. None of them is un unambiguous. And in my view, none of them is universal, immutable, or automatically applicable. It is safe to say, therefore, that these rights are not primary as hitherto believed, but derivative. 
of the eight strands I've mentioned comprising the right to life, I am concerned here with only three. The first one is to the right to have one's life maintained. And this leads to a more general quandary. To what extent can one use other people's bodies, their property, their time, their resources, deprive them of pleasure, comfort, material possessions, income, or any other thing? To what extent you can use other people in order to maintain your own life? Even if it were possible in reality, it is indefensible to maintain that I have a right to sustain, improve, or prolong my life at another another's expense. I cannot demand, though I can morally expect, even a trivial and minimal sacrifice from another person in order to prolong my life. I have the right to do so. Of course, the existence of an implicit, let alone explicit, contract between myself and another person would change the picture somewhat. The right to demand sacrifices, commensurate with the provisions of that contract, would then crystallize and create corresponding duties and obligations. For example, no embryo has a right to sustain its life, maintain or prolong it, at the mother's expense. This is true, regardless of how insignificant the sacrifice required of her is. Yet, by knowingly and intentionally conceiving the embryo, the mother can be, can be said to have signed a contract with the embryo. This contract causes the right of the embryo to demand such sacrifices from his mother to, crist to crystallize. It also creates corresponding duties and obligations of the mother towards her embryo. We often find ourselves in a situation where we do not have a given right against any other individual, but we do possess this very same right against, for example, society. Society owes us what no constituent individual does. This, thus, we all have a right to sustain our lives, maintain our lives, prolong our lives, or even improve our lives at society's expense, and no matter how major and significant the resources required are. Public hospitals, state pension schemes, and police forces may be needed in order to fulfill society's obligations to prolong, maintain, and improve my life. But fulfill, the, fulfill this, these obligations, it must. Still, each one of us can sign a contract with society, implicitly or explicitly, and abrogate these rights. One can volunteer to join the army. Such an act constitutes a contract in which the individual assumes the duty or obligation to give up his or her life. It's a form of regulated suicide. Euthanasia could be such a form as well. And that leads to the next strand, and that is the right to not be killed. It is commonly agreed that every person has a right to not be killed unjustly. Admittedly, what is just and what is unjust is determined by an ethical calculus or a social contract, and both of them are constantly in flux. Still, even if we assume an Archimedean immutable point of moral reference, does a person's right not to be killed mean that third parties are to refrain from enforcing the rights of other people against that, against that person? What if the only way to right wrongs committed by that person against others is to kill that person. The moral obligation to right wrongs is about restoring the rights of the wrong. If a certain person threatens to kill other people, don't we have the moral right to kill him? If the continued existence of a person is predicated on the repeated and continuous violation of the rights of others, and these other people object to these violations, then that person must be killed if that is the only way to right the wrong and reassert the rights of that person's victims. So the right to be, not to be killed is very qualified by questions of justice and morality. And then there's the issue of personal autonomy. The right to have one's life terminated at will, in other words, the right to euthanasia, is subject to social, ethical, and legal strictures. In some countries, such as the Netherlands, it is legal and socially acceptable to have one's life terminated with the help of third parties, given a sufficient deterioration in the quality of life and given the imminence of death. One has to be of a sound mind and one has to will one's death knowingly, intentionally, repeatedly, forcefully and in front of witnesses. 
Should we have a right to die given hopeless medical circumstances? Is this a right that we have? When our wish to, to end it all conflicts with society's admittedly paternalistic judgment of what is right and what is good for us, what is good for others, what should prevail, our will or society's paternalistic instincts? On the one hand, as Patrick Henry puts it, give me liberty or give me death. A life without personal autonomy and without the freedom to make unpopular and non-conformist decisions, such as the decision to die, this kind of life is arguably not worth living at all. As Dworkin states, making someone die in a way that others approve, but he believes is horrifying, this, this is a contradiction of his life. It is a devastating, odious form of tyranny. Still, even if the victim's expressed wishes may prove to be transient and circumstantial, for example, the victim is depressed, or misinformed, or his judgment is clouded, um, can we then regard these wishes as immutable and invariable? What if these circumstances prove everyone, the victim included, wrong? What if a cure to the victim's disease is found 10 minutes after the euthanasia? How would we feel about the euthanasia? So, personal autonomy is an important value, but it is in conflict with other equally important values. Hence, the debate about euthanasia. The problem is intractable and insoluble precisely because of that. No moral calculus, itself based implicitly and explicitly, on a hierarchy of values. So no moral calculus can tell us which value overrides another and what are the true basic goods. It is commonly accepted that where two equally potent equipotent values clash, society steps in as an arbiter. The right to material welfare, for example, food, shelter, basic possessions. This right often conflicts with the right to own private property and benefit from it. And society strikes a fine balance by, by on, the, on the one hand, taking from the rich taxation and giving it to the poor through redistributive taxation, and on the other hand, prohibiting and punishing theft and looting. Euthanasia involves a few such finely balanced values. Fine tuning is needed. The sanctity of life versus personal autonomy. The welfare of the many versus the welfare of the individual the relief of pain versus the prolongation and preservation of life. So why can't society step in as an arbiter in these cases as well? Moreover, what if a person is rendered incapable of expressing his preferences with regards to the manner of, and timing of his death? Should society step in through the agency of his family or through the courts or legislature and make the decision for him? In a variety of legal situations, parents, court-appointed guardians, guardians, custodians, and conservators act for, on behalf of, and in lieu of, underage children, the physically and mentally challenged and the disabled. Why not here? We must distinguish between four situations. Scenario number one, the patient foresaw the circumstances and provided an advanced directive, a living will, asking explicitly for his life to be terminated, when certain conditions are met. Scenario number two, the patient did not provide an advance directive, but expressed his preference clearly before he was incapacitated. The risk here is that self-interested family members may simply lie. The third scenario is that the patient did not provide an advance directive and did not express his preference aloud, but the decision to terminate his life is commensurate with both his character and with other decisions he had made throughout his life. And the fourth scenario is, there is no indication, however indirect, that the patient wishes or would have wished to die had he been capable of expression. But the patient is no longer a person, and therefore has no interest to respect, observe, and protect. Moreover, the patient is a burden to himself, to his nearest and dearest, and to society at large. Euthanasia is the right, just, and most efficient thing to do, to pull the plug. Society can and often does legalize euthanasia, in the first case, subject to rigorous fact-checking, similarly in the second and third cases. To prevent economically motivated murder, disguised as euthanasia, 
non-voluntary and involuntary euthanasia, as said in the fourth case above, should be banned outright. There's a slippery slope here. There's an issue in the calculus of rights and the hierarchy of rights. The right to life supersedes in Western moral and legal systems, supersedes all other rights. It overrules the right to one's body, to comfort, to the avoidance of pain, to the ownership of property. Given such a lack of equivocation, the amount of dilemmas and controversies surrounding the right to life is therefore, therefore pretty surprising. When there is a clash between equally potent rights, for instance, the conflicting rights to life of two people, we can decide among them randomly by flicking, flipping a coin. Alternatively, we can add and subtract rights in a somewhat macabre arithmetic. Thus, if the continued life of an embryo or a fetus threatens the mother's life, that is, assuming controversially that both of them have an equal right to life, we can then decide to kill the fetus by adding the mother's right to life um, to her right to her own body, we outweigh the fetus's right to life. So there's a difference between killing and letting die. Counterintuitively, there is a moral gulf between killing, taking a life, and letting die, not saving a life. The right not to be killed is undisputed. There is no right to have one, but there is no right to have one's life saved. You have a right not to be killed, but you don't have a right to be, to be saved. Where there is a right, and only where there is a right, there is an obligation. Where there is no right, there's no obligation. Thus, while there is an obligation to not kill, there is no obligation to save a life. Anti-euthanasia ethicists fear that allowing one kind of euthanasia, even under the strict, strictest, most explicit conditions, will open the floodgates. The value of life will be depreciated, and made subordinate to considerations of economic efficacy or personal convenience. Murders disguised as act of euthanasia will proliferate, and none of us will be safe once we reach old age or become disabled. But years of legally sanctioned euthanasia in, in Netherlands, Switzerland, parts of Australia, in a state of, or two in the United States, years of such uh, practice and experience um, showed that this is not the case. Living wills have been accepted and complied with throughout the Western world for well over, for well over two decades. And this cumulative experience tends to fly in the face of such fears. Doctors did not uh, regard these shifts in public opinion and legislative climate as a blanket license to kill all their patients. Family members proved to be far less bloodthirsty and avaricious than feared. My conclusion is that as long as non-voluntary and involuntary types of euthanasia are treated as felonies, it seems safe to allow patients to exercise their personal autonomy and grant them the right to die. Legalizing the institution of advanced directive will go a long way towards regulating the field, as would a new code of medical ethics that will recognize and embrace reality. Doctors, patients, and family members very frequently collude in hospital settings in their millions to commit numerous acts and omissions of euthanasia every single day. It is their way of restoring dignity to the shattered lives of bodies and bodies of loved ones. Nothing's wrong with it, morally, ethically, or societally. Thank you for listening.